in this lecture we'll be looking at how local government is funded across the United Kingdom and obviously like with most things in local government there are key differences between England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. What I'd like you to do once you've uh, watched this lecture is to look at how your own local authority is funded um, and the different levels of revenue it receives from various uh, different parts of its funding package and then perhaps compare that to um, a different type of authority so if you live in a rural area maybe compare it to a metropolitan area or a London area um, if you live in a um, in a two-tier area compare the different funding streams for the two tiers so local government in England has four main sources of funding central and government grants business rates council tax and fees and charges and we'll cover all four um, in this slide so this will be quite hefty there are a wide range of additional central government grants for local bodies which sit outside local council control some of these go via local councils and the councils are required to pass them on e.g funding for primary and secondary schools um, or councils are required to spend them in line with national requirements such as housing benefit other national funds are spent locally without any involvement from councils. For instance, NHS funding, further education college funding, funding for trunk roads and motorways, for instance. For many decades, the bulk of council's income, on average, came from a combination of government grants and business rate income, the latter being redistributed by the government to take some account of need. Because of large reductions in government grants due to austerity since 2010, this is no longer as true as it was. Under the existing system, as a general rule, the less deprived an area, the less government grant it is likely to receive. This is because richer areas can raise more funding via council tax and business rates. There's not an exact link, but it is a useful rule of thumb. For many decades, all governments used the grant to ensure, as far as possible, that local councils could provide an equal level of service across the whole country. However, since 2010, on average, deprived areas have seen their grants cut more than less deprived areas because they began with bigger grants to cut based on their level of need. So the first area is central government grants. Central government grants for local councils are set each financial year in an annual funding round, the local government finance settlement. Since 2010, grants have been cut dramatically uh, by 37% across England between 2010 and 2015. Uh, there's no clear formula that can be used to explain how much money an individual council gets or should get in a grant. There are different formulas for some elements of it. The annual funding round takes the previous year as its starting point. So, grant levels result from the build-up of different decisions, large and small, over many years. Um, some people advocate for a zero base accounting system where every year, well actually they would, they would advocate for longer funding settlements over four or five years, perhaps. Um, and to start it completely based on need rather than what went before. That might be something to think about in your essays or something to research. Once local authorities know the level of revenue support grant funding they will receive as set out in the local government finance settlement, they're able to finalise their budget for the coming year. And local authorities then decide how much they expect to spend in the coming year, what income, other than that from government, they expect to raise in the following year, and how they can use their financial reserves to fund spending or keep down council tax. The second area is business rates. Business rates are paid by business, obviously, to local councils. Responsibility for business rates is devolved in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, although it works in a broadly similar way. First of all, you calculate by the rateable value times by a multiplier. So the rateable value of a property is the first element in the calculation and the rateable values in England, Scotland and Wales are assessed on a five yearly basis by the Valuation Office Agency, uh, which is an executive agency of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Um, the second element, oh sorry no, the f normally right, the rateable value of a property reflects the annual rent that it could have been let for on the open market. Okay, so that's the first part. The second element in the rates bill is the multiplier, which is normally expressed in pence per pound, although you can think of it as a percentage. This is set by the UK government for England, the Scottish Parliament for Scotland, and the National Parliament, so the Welsh Assembly, so, well, the Welsh Parliament uh, in Wales. In Northern Ireland, district councils set one multiplier, and a further one is set by the Northern Irish Executive. Um, 
In England, Scotland and Wales, in each financial year, the multiplier may be raised by a maximum of the inflation rate of the retail price index from the previous September. Um, but in England, the government uses a uh, consumer price index for this. So the business rate liability, or the amount they owe, is calculated by multiplying the rateable value of a property by the multiplier. Hence, a property with a rateable value of £100,000 and a multiplier of 49.3 pence in the pound would have an annual business rate liability of £49,300. However, a rise in rateable value at revaluation does not lead to a rise in overall revenue from business rates. The multiplier is typically adjusted to ensure that the overall yield from rates remains the same, taking into account additional physical property, i.e., if you build more areas for business, um, you will be able to get more in terms of business rate. Um, but if you don't, from one year to the next, you should raise broadly the same amount in business rates. To ensure overall revenue neutrality, the multiplier was reduced by several pence in the pound at the 2005 and 2010 revaluations. Um, and so what this kind of does is that it incentivizes councils to build more um, especially in England where control, um, where business rate retention is being increased so councils keep more of their business rate, this incentivizes, uh, yeah, incentivizes the um, welcoming of more businesses to a council area but it should decentivize um, the desire to keep hiking taxes up on business. So it means that the only way to increase business rate revenue is to, is to get more business in your area. Um, now, those who believe in, in local democratic government would argue or could argue that local authorities should be free to set higher rates of business um, tax or higher levels of business rates um, if they need to raise more money. You shouldn't have this cap on the amount that can be, uh, that can be raised. Councils uh, will also be able to, um, this is being changed, sorry, under devolution deals, those areas with an elected mayor and a devolution deal on the metro level will be able to raise rates by small amounts um, and councils will also be allowed to cut business rates. Um, but the local government association welcomed this and critics, though, worried that it will make it harder to redistribute money from richer to poorer areas. Um, and there's also concerns about a race to the bottom as councils try to attract businesses to their area by cutting tax, which forces other areas to do the same and which reduces the amount of money that uh, local authorities can actually raise for providing services. Okay. Then we also have council tax. Council tax funding is collected by district councils and unitary authorities. County councils and parish councils also set an amount called a precept that is collected alongside this as part of council tax. Police and fire authorities, transport authorities also collect shares. Each council keeps all of the council tax revenue it collects and none is redistributed between councils, which is problematic, I would suggest, uh, because it means that wealthy, well, we'll come to this later, but it means that wealthy areas can charge a lower council tax on wealthier residents, so those with the broadest shoulders are paying less, um, whereas those in areas of higher need, such as, say, Liverpool, will have to have higher council tax bills. So there's not, it's not really very fair. Um, since 2012, um, councils have not been able to raise council tax by more than a set level each year without a referendum approving the rise. Um, in the last three, well, up until recently, it's been 2%. Um, in 2018 and 19, uh, the thresholds were 3% or £5 on a band D bill for district councils, 3% for fire and rescue authorities and the Greater London Authority, £12 on a band D bill for police and crime commissioners. Um, but local authorities with social care responsibilities, so that's county councils and unitary authorities, could have a threshold of 6% increase. 3% of which has to be for adult social care. Um, and then we also have what are known as billing authorities that I kind of mentioned there. So council tax is collected by the principal council that has the functions of a district level authority um, identified in legislation as a billing authority. Um, so there are 326 billing authorities that do this and they are basically your, your non-metropolitan district councils, your unitary authorities, your metropolitan borough councils, your London borough councils. 
not the county councils, not city regions, not London Assembly, blah, blah, blah. It is collected by those district level authorities. Um, and then, as we said, there's also the precepting authorities that include, say, like parish councils. Um, fees and charges can be put on a large number of council services. Um, some fee levels are fixed by the government, such as planning and licensing fees, while councils have control over others, such as parking charges. Um, there are a small number of services at which they are not allowed to charge for, such as education, elections and libraries. Um, and some councils, usually small districts, make more from fees and charges than they do from actual council tax. And so, how do councils spend this money? Well, most money from these four sources is brought together into a single funding pool and can be spent how the council chooses. There are a few small exceptions to this, uh, including ring-fenced or hypothecated funding. So, for instance, the government provides a public health grant, which has to be spent on public health. Uh, otherwise, it'd just be called a grant. But other grants can be spent more freely. Um, even if they often have names that suggest they are supposed to be spent on a specific function. Councils can also borrow money for capital investment projects, e.g. to build a new road or a leisure centre, but they can't borrow in order to plug gaps in their everyday spending on services. They can borrow money from the government, from banks or by issuing bonds. Uh, the main limit on council borrowing is how far they can guarantee future income to pay off the debt. This means that how much councils can borrow is closely linked to the amount they bring in through council tax and business rates. There was a lot there. It might be worth listening to it again. And as always, the House of Commons Library um, and the Institute for Government have good primers on sources of local government funding. As the Institute for Government notes, local authority spending power, uh, that is the amount of money local authorities have to spend from government grants, council taxes, business rates, has fallen by 18% since 2010 largely because of reductions in central government grants, which have been cut the most uh, sharply um, since 2010. Central government grants, including retained business rates, were cut 38% in real terms, um, from 34.6 billion to 24.8 billion in cash terms. Whilst grants from central government were cut, rates of council tax were increased, which contributed to a 21% increase in real terms in the amount that local authorities raised from council tax. So, to some extent, the burden of local government spending has been shifted from grants um, from central government, which is tended, you know, ideally is raised from across uh, the population proportionately based on their ability to pay, to local councils um, through council tax, which, as we mentioned earlier, might not have uh, as much of an ability uh, to pay. Again, thinking of more deprived areas like, like the kind of Merseyside councils um, compared to, say, affluent, you know, Cheshire or Tata, whatever, you know what I mean. One other thing to bear in mind when it comes to council tax rates, uh, this is just taken off Wikipedia, um, is that they're based on hugely outdated values of properties. So this is relative to 1991 prices uh, in England. In Wales, it's relative to 2003 prices. Um, and in Scotland, it's relative to 1991 prices. And so what we have is places that have done very well out of house price inflation um, have Basically, people paying well under what they would otherwise be paying if their house um, was revalued now. So think of somewhere in London, right? A house that was only, I don't know, say 90 grand in 1991 will probably be worth half a million now. Maybe not that much, but it would certainly go from band E to band H. And therefore, the amount of council tax you'd be able to claim from that, from the, from that property would increase. So another argument for local government reform is uh, council tax ban revaluation. But obviously that's politically painful, right? So it is avoided. And you wouldn't have this issue with a personal income tax um, like a, or an extra ban on income tax to fund local government services or on a rolling revaluation. But no government has been willing to, to kind of grasp the nettle and do this. By 2020, local authorities will have faced a reduction uh, in core funding from the government of nearly £16 billion. That means the councils will have lost roughly 60 pence out of every £1 the government has provided to spend on local services in the last eight or so years. Uh, next year, 168 councils will receive no revenue support grant at all. Uh, various cuts to local government in England and Wales can be identified. Um, 
So in 2013, the responsibility for delivering public health services was transferred to councils. Now, whilst funding for the NHS has increased year on year between 2015 and 2020, funding for public health uh, will be reduced by 14%, around half a billion pounds. Council tax support schemes are no longer fully funded, um, with nearly half of the original funding, around £1.7 billion, removed between 2020, 2013 and 2020. Um, However, councils were also not given full discretion to target and reform the schemes to make them truly local and to help deal with reductions in funding. As a result, more than, than 573,000 households no longer receive council tax support um, in 2017 compared to 2013. And this is having a clear impact on local councils' ability to deliver key services. So the number of homeless households by, supported by local authorities grew no, almost 11 times faster than the total population. Um, there's a £9 billion pound backlog of pothole repairs across England. Um, in just two, in one year, between 2016 and 17 and 2017 18, councils had to absorb a funding shortfall of £2.4 billion. Pounds. Um, and so with the pressures on adults and children's social care, other council services will also have reduced uh, unavoidable, sorry, will have received unavoidable reductions. And councils now spend less on early intervention, support for the voluntary sector has been reduced, rural bus services have been scaled back, libraries have been closed and other services have also taken a hit. Now the Local Government Association forecasts that local services face a funding gap of 7.8 billion by 2025. Uh, this was pre-pandemic, so it's not clear how this might have changed. Um, and the gap corresponds to keeping local authority services standing still and only having to meet additional demand and deal with inflation. It does not include any extra funding needed to improve services or reverse any cuts uh, made before 2017-18. So local government funding is in a bit of a dire position. All local authorities have had to find ways to do more with less in the face of cuts to their spending power. But the size of the cuts since 2010 has varied across different types of local authorities. Metropolitan districts, primarily local authorities in cities, and London local authorities have seen uh, the biggest or have borne the biggest reduction in spending power since 2010. This is because central government grants were cut and these grants made up a larger share of income for local authorities in areas of higher deprivation, many of which are metropolitan districts or London authorities. So central funding is obviously made up of a number of different grants which are bundled uh, together into the local government finance settlement. Um, the council, uh, the calculations used to create the settlement take into account each council's ability to raise its own revenue in order to balance funding across authority areas and ensure they are able to carry out services. Um, shows that grant funding has decreased every year since uh, 2010 11 for all types of local authority. So in uh, March 2018, the National Audit Office used the same data to estimate that total funding across England is set to fall in real terms by 56.3% between 2010 to 11 and 2019 to 20. Um, One thing uh, to note from the core spending power per person by local authority in England maps so are the one on the right is that just the sheer difference right between um, different councils. So spending power per person in Kensington and Chelsea and affluent borough is a thousand pound, whereas in Wandsworth it's five. It's just five hundred and seventy four. Right. So a clear imbalance is there. So because of the large variations in local authorities' ability to raise their own revenue, it can be more useful to look at estimated core spending power. That is the total amount of money that local authorities have available to them for making decisions, taking into account their income from council tax fees and business rates. Um, this shows that spending power, much like grant funding, is highest in inner London boroughs, but the variation between the types of authority is much less than for central grant funding. This is because those authorities which can raise more of their own revenue typically receive less central grant funding, meaning the overall amount of money is more evened out. This indicates the spending power is set to start increasing in all types of authorities, um, or was expected to from 2017 to 18 onwards, after several years of decreasing. Uh, this is because higher council tax rates, the ability to retain a larger proportion of business rates are expected to increase the amount of revenue raised by local authorities. 
Should authorities not realize these expected gains, their spending power will end up being lower than currently predicted. Now, what we can see is that even though that the spending power of local authorities might start to, uh, to increase, this is only a year on year change. So what this means is that if you have 10 years of decrease and then an 11th year where you have a slight increase that takes you, you know, 5% up, that will show as a year on year change. OK, not absolute values, which we saw in the earlier slide, which shows that local government is still spending at a lower level uh, than it used to in 2010. So it's important not to get confused by uh, year on year and um, and kind of full level change. Right. The next few slides um, show. So the next slide shows the spending by local authorities, um, which I think kind of illustrates the point that. I just made then right it might be the case that from 2018 compared to 2017 total spending went up but if you put that so that would be a year on year increase right but put that into perspective that's still a decrease of you know roughly just under 10 billion pound um spending by local authorities in england and then the two slides after that just show um settlement funding for liverpool um, and net current spending for Liverpool. And you can find your own local authority from the link in the notes for that page. So from 2010 to 11 to 2014 to 15, local authority revenue in Wales fell by half, well, £461 million in real terms. Uh, the Welsh Government provides around 80% of funding for local authorities. During the fourth Welsh Assembly, this funding reduced significantly as the decrease in the Welsh Block Grant, estimated to be £1.2 billion lower in real terms, um, impacted on local government. The Block Grant money being the money the Welsh Assembly receives from the UK Parliament or the money the Welsh Assembly receives from English taxpayers. The Welsh Government provides funding to local authorities based on a distribution formula which is maintained by the, the distribution subgroup and it contains 68 different indicators. For example, there are indicators that relate to population, number of children and older adults, road lengths, deprivation, rurality and sparsity. Elements of the, fund, of the formula are updated each year and the formula was last fully reviewed ahead of the 2001-2002 settlement. Um, some of the calculations use data from the 1991 and 2001 census, and this has been raised as a concern. But overall, this seems like a very clever way of deciding who gets what funding. And, you know, there's always talk about lecturers putting their own thoughts into lecture notes, but it seems to me that this is a very sensible way of doing it. And it seems to me that what you really want is a, a system that rewards local councils when they do good things like encourage business growth um, and encourage uh, new house building but that also balances out funding based on need right and if that means some redistribution from one area to another well that's kind of the point of living in a political community isn't it in the case of Wales, historically funding floors uh, as well as spending caps and top-ups have been used to limit reductions where necessary. For example, in 2016-17, three authorities with the largest reductions received a top-up grant, meaning no reduction was more than 3%. This required an additional £2.5 million allocation from Welsh Government resources. Rural authorities have argued that the formula does not adequately account for the additional cost of providing services across sparsely populated areas. Uh, of the total indicators, only 6% relate to sparsity, while 69% are based on clients or you know people, so population, pupil numbers, and 25% on deprivation. Um, we can break down Welsh local government funding. Uh, you have the General Revenue Support Grant um, at about 3.3 billion, Redistributed Non-Domestic Rates, NDR, at about 1.1 billion. Um, business rates were fully devolved to Wales as of April the 1st, 2015. Um, it's not an April Fool's and revenue from business rates now remains in Wales and is redistributed amongst Welsh local authorities by the National Assembly or National Parliament. Previously, rises and falls in Welsh rate revenue were compensated for by the Barnet formula, i.e. again English taxpayers, so the Assembly's budget was not effective. Uh, the Assembly has the power to set the multiplier since its establishment uh, in the business rate multiplier in, since its establishment in 1999. 
Scottish local government funding is different. Here, Holyrood provides the bulk of local government funding split into three parts. That's the general revenue grant, non-domestic rates income and specific revenue grants. So the general revenue grant supports uh, council's general net revenue expenditure. And the size of the grant is calculated to make up the difference between local authorities' standard spending assessment, how much you will need to spend to provide a standard level of service, and the sum of resources obtained from national non-domestic rates and council tax. And the final figure is based on relative need. So the local authorities with greater levels of poverty, for example, will receive more money. Uh, the formulas determining this are created in consultation with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities using indicators such as population, pupil numbers and deprivation. Non-domestic rates income uh, is set centrally and pooled centrally but generated locally and is distributed back to local authorities through a distribution formula agreed with the COLSA as part of local government uh, finance settlements. Valuations take place every five years. Uh, specific revenue grants are set and distributed in connection with specific policy initiatives and expectations. These grants can only be used for specific services and so are ring-fenced. Uh, the 2018 to 2019 specific grants are for Gaelic, uh, Pupil Equity Fund and Early Learning and Childcare Expansion, uh, amongst other things like criminal justice, social work. So there's a, a wide range um, of different grants available. And then we have something called a Bellwin Scheme, which is discretionary and exists to give emergency financial assistance to local authorities who would otherwise suffer an undue financial burden as a result of providing relief and carrying out immediate work due to large-scale emergencies. Uh, there's no automatic entitlement to assistance and local authorities are expected to reserve a small amount of their annual budget for dealing with unforeseen emergencies as well. Uh, council tax. Each individual council sets the rate that applies in their local area. Uh, administers and collects the tax themselves and determines how the receipts are used to fund local services. The Scottish Parliament is responsible for the legislation that defines council tax and increases are to be capped or were capped at 3% in the financial years 2017-18 to and 18-19. to uh, However, councils in Scotland still face challenges. So in response to funding reductions, councils approved about half a billion pound of saving and the use of uh, £79 million of their reserves when setting budgets for 2016-17. Council's savings plan is focused on reducing staff numbers, rationalising surplus property and improving the procurement of goods and services. Debt increased by nearly a billion pound in 2016-17 as councils took advantage of low interest rates to borrow more to invest in larger capital programmes. Council debt levels are not currently problematic, but some are becoming concerned about affordability of costs associated with debt within future budgets. And councils are showing signs of increasing financial stress. They're finding it increasingly difficult to identify and deliver savings, and more have drawn on reserves than in previous years to fund change programmes and routine service delivery. Some councils risk running out of general fund reserves within two to three years if they continue to use them at levels planned for 2017-18. Council funding continues to fall as cost pressures increase. Uh, Scottish Government funding fell again in real terms in 2017-18. Councils received a further real terms reduction of 2.3% in their funding from the Scottish Government, reflecting the overall trend and direction of travel. Council's funding continues to include money targeted at delivering national policy commitments that restricts the overall flexibility in their budget setting. Uh, in 2017-18, this included £120 million provided for the school attainment fund and £88 million for maintaining pupil-teacher ratios uh, and for the teacher induction scheme. And so what we see is a, a centralisation within uh, Scotland, especially under the SNP, for restricting what councils can and can't spend their uh, budgets on. Reductions in Scottish Government funding were only partially offset by the end of the council tax freeze. So the council tax freeze ended in 2017-18, 24 councils choose to increase their council tax, with 21 approving the maximum 3% permitted. 14 councils chose to remove temp the 10% discount on second homes, another option for increasing revenue. Uh, for some councils, additional income from second homes is not significant, but for others in nicer areas it is. There were reforms to council tax banding multipliers uh, for 2017-18 to 18 that resulted in a further £110 million of council tax due across the 32 councils. Now this will be available as in full as additional income to be spent in the local authority area it is collected. As in Scotland and Wales, local councils receive most of their funding from the next tier up, here the Northern Ireland Executive. 
However, most of this money in turn comes from the UK Exchequer under the Barnet formula and maintains a broad parity with English public spending. As a result of UK level austerity politics, funding for Northern Irish local authorities has declined appreciably. A collection of rates is handled centrally by the Land and Property Services Agency of the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, as the community charge, uh, poll tax, and the replacement council tax were not introduced in Northern Ireland, domestic rates remain in place, alongside non-domestic rates for businesses. Both the Northern Irish Executive and local authorities levy a rate for domestic and non-domestic rates. Um, when the Northern Irish Executive is not operating, the regional rate has been set by the UK Parliament. Uh, non Domestic rates in Northern Ireland were last revalued in 2015 and previously in, 20, in 2001. Mayoral combined authorities have a number of powers to raise small quantities of additional funding. Uh, elector, elected mayors will be able to raise a precept on constituent authorities' council tax bills, but only when the order establishing them allows them to do so. Where the mayor is also the police and crime commissioner um, and thus raises a precept in that capacity, the funds must be kept separate. Combined authorities, with or without mayors, may raise a levy on their members for any of their functions. So this <coughs> constitutes a shift of funding between tiers of local government, rather than a means to raise new money locally. A number of devolution deals permit local retention of 100% of business rate revenue growth above an agreed baseline. Furthermore, several areas are piloting full retention of business rate revenue. Uh, details of the pilot are available on the DCLG website. And elected mayors were to have the power to raise an additional 2% levy um, on business rates, and this power was to have been introduced by the Local Government Finance Bill 2016-17, but this bill fell due to the snap general election in 2017, and it didn't feature in the post-election Queen's speech. Uh, combined authorities will have the power to borrow money under the Local Government Prudential Borrowing Regime, and many of the devolution deals provide combined authorities with an investment fund. These powers and functions to be transferred to combined authorities will come with existing funding streams in the first instance. Uh, future levels of funding for these activities will be dependent on government decision making and negotiation. Uh, the government has produced a number of devolution guidance notes which include indicative budgets for some uh, devolved functions. As we mentioned earlier, parish councils are also able to set a precept on uh, council tax bills and this is often their, their main source of funding. The income and expenditure for parish councils for the next financial year are calculated in the form of estimates and this amount is added to the local council tax and then returned to parishes in two yearly instalments. Uh, they could also apply for UK grants um, and in the past funding for EU money under objectives one or two and unlike other local authorities uh, or other levels of councils, there's no limit on the amount to which parish councils can increase their precept. Here is an example of um, a local council tax from Blaby District Council in Leicestershire, England, and it just shows where that money raised through the council tax uh, goes to or goes on. Councils today have, on average, less money available than in 2010. Most have much less, between 20% and 40% uh, less. Many people within the council sector have caused, called for councils to have more ways of raising their own money. This is known in the jargon as fiscal devolution. The main ways in which this could be done are uh, as follows. Firstly, councils can strive for efficiency or sharing costs. Um, however, this is, well, in the past, this has achieved nearly a billion pound, 805 million pound of cumulative efficiency savings. But the scope to do this um, is limited, right? Once you've kind of, it's a one-off saving. Um, councils are currently um, sharing best practice in order to drive down costs, but there will always be a natural variation in the cost of delivering services from area to area. Um, but over time, there's been a convergence in these costs showing that, that if the range is narrower, it means that local authorities are, in theory anyway, kind of getting towards the real cost of delivering those services, stripping out the, the local variations and stripping out inefficiencies. Um, other ways for more money for local authorities is the obvious, more government grant funding. Um, this is unlikely. But at least with the end of austerity and the idea of building back better by the current government, it might be that conservative views on local government funding might change. 
Um, they could also raise more in council tax. So in real terms, council tax has been reduced by 10% since 2010, thanks partially to the, the law on uh, the referendum requirements for anything over um, 2 or 3%. A greater range of council tax bans, right? So higher council tax bans could be introduced uh, for more valuable properties. Um, this could cause unhappiness amongst those paying higher bills, but it could also see bills for smaller and medium-sized houses go down. Wealthy areas with large number of valuable properties could gain a lot more income if this was done, but typically the areas with the wealthier properties have lower levels of need. So it might actually just benefit um, wealthier areas and not really help the poorer areas that are struggling. Um, greater control over business rates, as we've mentioned, and more fees and charges. Um, but again, it could just lead to punitive fees for you know what really should be a given within local government service, purely to plug holes elsewhere. Um, new local taxes, such as tourist taxes, could be introduced. But again, this would probably not raise sufficient money to cover the core roles of local government. Um, and then some councils are using rules to develop their own investment portfolios, right? Which is risky, basically. Um, but one example is Eastleigh Borough Council have built up a property portfolio and used the income from it to supplement other sources of income. So in 2011, Eastleigh owned £188 million of commercial property, which gave a net annual profit of £2.5 million in the context of an overall budget of about, one, uh, of about £14 million. So that's significant. And then other forms of taxes could be created or devolved. Right, local income tax or VAT could be collected or distributed, well, not collected on a local level, but distributed on a local level. But really, in all of these, all of these areas, you will get lower tax rates, lower tax collection from areas of lower economic activity, which tend to correlate highly with areas of deprivation. Right. So what you need is a mechanism that to some extent equalises funding, um, but at the same time incentivises councils to cut waste and to encourage business growth and building houses, essentially, right? So it's obviously not easy, and given that there will be clear losers from reforming the current system, and the winners might not be that obvious or might not win that much there, it's easy to oppose any reform to local government finance. But there does seem to be an, a broad agreement um, amongst the commentariat that... Um, that something has to be done and maybe this will form part of build back better proposals.